Welcome everyone. Um, welcome everyone. First join us, Neville. What's up, Gus? <laughs> Yo, what's up? Um, welcome, man. Welcome. Glad to have a man online. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, for those of you guys who are probably new to what we do, we have been doing this for, for a while now. And um, and um, if you notice, Lato has sent a flyer with invitation um, this past weekend. And we actually, I didn't have the name of our ministry up there. This is the name of our ministry. We've had it for a while. Um, Foundation Building Builders Ministry. And, and, and we are in helping people to understand the word of God and apply the word of God in a practical way so that they can live their life out here on earth. So our ministry is, is about discipling people. A disciple, in the word disciple, just simply means um, a learner. And so when Christ was leaving, he says, he says, we must go and make disciples of all mankind, teaching them to obey the things I've commanded. So, so, so we're in the business of, of helping people, teaching people based on the word of God, giving them principles that may be useful to help them to live effectively in their marriages, with their kids, on the job, with their health, the mental, as we wait Christ's return. That's what we're about. And what I've realized that, if, as you guys should know this, if a foundation of a house is not solid, doesn't matter what you build, it's going to come down. And so we want to make sure that as we present, we're laying foundational truth. We're not laying something that is hype, something that you walk when you feel good. And next thing you ask the question, how this thing help me? We're not about that. We're about giving things that can scriptural and um, biblical principles that when you grab one of these, it can help you. So that's it. We've been in marriage ministry for a while. Um, youth group, I'm an RDN minister um, with, with a mental health, emotional health. Do, we, 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 we think those things are important. Those things are not what save you, but we all struggle with those things in this life. And I believe if, if we understand these issues, if we understand these issues that we face, I believe that we can be more successful as we walk this walk here on, here on earth. So that's what our ministry and nutshell is really all about. It's about teaching some fundamental you know, principles, things that affects us, that when we get it right, it makes our life better. Um, um, so, so that's what we're really are about. And so this morning, we're going to jump into, into all those issues that, that affects us here on earth, that can affect our life in many different ways um, and affect our witnesses, affect us personally, relationally with other people, and affect our witnesses for God here on earth. Now, when Christ was on earth, he shared many parables with the people, many parables. And he, he, he talked about many things. But, but one topic that Christ um, addressed more than anything else while he was here on earth is that of money. Christ has so much to say about money. It, it, in fact, most of Morpheus' parables are about money or possessions than anything else. Even Solomon, we regard as the wisest man on the face of the earth. Solomon's in, 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 in Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, and songs of Solomon, he has a whole lot to say about money. I, I was, I, I don't know what truth this really is, but, but one, one, one theologian quote that's quoted that, that um, the, in the Bible, there were over 2,000 mention of possession or money in the Bible. So my question was, why did Jesus spend so much time talking about money? Why does the Bible address the issue of money so much? Far more than many issues that we spend so much time dealing with in the church. If you think about the church building, we talk about so many other things um, that, 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 that not, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about those things. But, but here is this one thing that we don't spend time dissecting, we don't spend time looking the right way that Christ does so much with. And I think he did this because it was important because you realize it affects us here on earth and it affects all witnesses here on earth. In fact, he said, we can't serve God and money. And despite, despite emphasizing this topic, laid out, we oftentimes get it wrong. And I said, we, not you, I said, we, because I know I've gotten it wrong before. So what we normally do, we normally take one of two positions when it comes to money. We say money is root of all. We say money. Say money. Here's what we say: money is root of all evil. The Bible didn't say money is root of all evil. In fact, it says the love of money. But we say money is root of all evil. 
or, or which says it's easier for, for, for a camel to enter to the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, of God. And, 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 and so on one hand, we, 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 we reject the whole issue of wealth. We reject the whole issue of, 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 of money, having money. Because somehow having wealth is having wealth is equated with, with us being, be, being, being um, if we have money, we, we're not Christian enough. The poor we are, the, the, the more we are. I would take the scripture, blessed are the poor in spirit, to mean that we're supposed to be poor. If we're not poor, we can't serve God. So that's one hand is that we don't need to reach, we don't need to have money, we don't need to have wealth. But on the other hand, we quote scriptures as God wanted to prosper in all things that we talk about. Solomon was rich and, and God would grant me desires of my heart. And so I, nothing's wrong with being rich and I want to be rich. We need to get this money issue right. We need to get this money issue right. And we need to get it right biblically. But before we jump into what the Bible has to say about money, let's look and see what is money. Money is simply a medium of exchange. That means you, 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 you have something in your possession. In, in Jamaica, United States, we have the paper, dot, paper note, and we have coins. That represents some wealth that we have. And we exchange it for something that we need to live. So I have this paper of money in my hand. It, it's, it's a medium of exchange. When I give you my dollar, I get food. When I give you my dollar, I, I get shelter. Give my dollar, I have light. Give my dollar, I get clothes. Give my dollar, I can go on a plane. You guys get it. So, so what it does, we exchange that for what we need to live. The thing about money is that money is neutral. Money is neither good nor bad. Money will say it's not good or bad. For, for, for example, if, if, if I should come to you and I give you a, a million dollars and I don't tell you um, where this money came from, you would take that money and you would go and you would spend it. Even if it's drugs money. But you don't know it's drugs money, so you will take the money. But the moment, the moment we, we, um, we realize it's drugs money, we may not want to use it. We may not want to take it. Or if it's blood money, we don't want to take it. But the money, nothing's wrong with the money within itself. But it's just how we look at money. It's a problem. It's our understanding concerning money that determines our attitude and subsequently how we use it. Hope that is making sense. And I'm not encouraging you to take drugs money or blood money. That's not my point. My point is that if you don't know and you get this money, you take that money and you spend it, you go to your bed, you sleep, you're fine. But the moment if you realize that this money, you know, was, was someone robbed, someone got the money, or someone killed, got the money, drugs money, you, you start feeling different, diff, different weird about the money because it's how we view money in all. Not having money to take care of one's daily need can affect what we do and how we live. When we do not have it, it affects us. But buying into the notion that we need to be wealthy is also another trap. So on one hand, we need money. We need money in one hand. We, we need, the Bible says that money answers all things. Are we going to get back to that in a while? So we need it. You, let's face facts. But, that, but, but, but buying the notion that we, we need to be wealthy, where we have to be wealthy, and we have to be wealthy, is also another trap. Because what money will do, money will lie to us. Money will tell us, if you lose me, you lose a large part of your life. If you lose me, you lose what life can be for you. If, you, if, if, you, if I don't have it, I am your life. Do you realize how big I am? Life will be real life, truly life, if you have me. So money can present itself in such a way. Now, I want to present a balance, a balance teaching on money biblically. <clears throat> I want to make it clear that nothing is wrong with wealth. It is, it is desire to be wealthy, which is a problem, because it will almost always lead to death of some kind, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and derailing dreams and goals that we may have. All right? Now, it's important we talk about it again. Because again, we say that Christ dealt with the issues of money more than any other topic. All right? Now, again, money affects our everyday lives and subsequently our witness. Think about it. People will lie. They will thieve. They will do all manner of evil just to get money. So we have to talk about it. You think about it. When money presents itself, truth becomes evasive. When, when money is online, and, and you know you're going to get some money, truth becomes problematic. 
It becomes more difficult for us to be truthful in our dealings whenever money is involved. Am, am, I, am, am I making sense? Thumbs up for making sense so far. I can't, I, can't, I can't see you guys' faces, so I want to make sure I'm making sense. Making sense? <laughs> all right, no one is going up. All right, so, so I figure, I figure that my students who sit in the classroom. All right, thank you, Ms. Batnala. Thank you, ma'am. You're my A student. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you, Janet. Good. So, so I'm, I'm making sense. All right, so to so talk about it, look, look at Judas. Judas betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. All right? It affects us. It affects us. Money can capture and trap our hearts. The Bible says, where your heart is, there you will be. It will guide what you do. And sometimes it can take us away from God. Money can mess up families. Money can mess up relationships. If you think about it, growing on thinking about the arguments that people have where family turn against family, it's because of a piece of land. It's because of inheritance that's left behind. And people are just into the want money. The, even when they have, they want the money. And so what it does, it captures our heart, captures our thinking, and greed sets in, and, and people kill people over money. Um, um, wives cheat on husband, husband cheat on wife because of money. Listen, it's important. Listen, and, and there's no children on the line, but, but for those of us who are grown and married, if you think about it, when we don't have money, not even sex feels good. We have money in the bed lying down with the wife beside you. Not even sex feel good. I, I don't know about you. I mean, the sex good still not, but, but, but to be honest with you, you, you don't have the money. You, you, the money is not dear, and, and you dear, you might be doing what you're doing, but you're thinking about how the bill going to pay. And the wife will say, Walk this man. No, well, my wife doesn't say about me, no. But the wife will say, Walk this man. All you want is sex. What about the light bill? That's it, because your mind is not settled. So, so what ends up happening is that we are, we are at a place and we can't please our spouses. The children come in and we just lease them, we shout at them. Always argument, always bickering because needs are not being met and the money is not there to meet the needs. So people become irritable and this is where people go out of their way to get the money and cause relationships to be broken up and, and farm to be broken up. In the United States, for example, 22% of divorces end because of money. Because of money issue, financial problems, 22%. So it's important. No, and, and here's something I want to share. What I've realized that money drives many of our careers. When we're choosing careers many time, we choose our careers because of money. And, and, and sometimes it, it drives us away from from our, our, our desires that God placed inside of us. Something that drives us away from what we know we need to do, from what we love. And so when we have our children, for example, we want our children to grow up and have jobs that pay a lot of money. And sometimes it's about us. We just want, we just want to show off sometimes and say, well, my child is a, is a biological engineer or my child is a neurosurgeon and because they get so much and we want them to have a lot of money. And, 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 and on the surface, Nothing is wrong with us water children to be successful, have a job that can take care of their, their living. But when we're so consumed about them making money and we're pushing, making money, making money, making money, what that, that will guide their hearts, that will guide their thinking, and that will push them in a direction possibly away from what God wants them to do. Now, my daughter, I'm going to share my, my daughter, Desri, she's 25. She's going to start her PhD. Um, but my, well, she's going to start her PhD in, in um, education. I always say she's going to do it. I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, but that, there's no money in, 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 in education. I, I, I'm a teacher, by the way. <laughs> but I'm saying, there's no money in education. That's what I was saying to myself. I didn't say this to her, you know. You know, so, so you, know, you know, she's going to spend so many years. And so I called her up. And I said, Desiree. I just want, she wants so many change she's making, and I just want to make certain she's making the right decision. So I call her, Desri, how are you feeling about what you're doing? I said, Daddy, I'm feeling very good about it. Daddy, I enjoy what I'm doing. I want to do this. And when I said that, I felt good. I backed away from her. Because she's now doing something that she loves, something she wants to do. But it becomes about the money 
as a parent, as parents, we can press them now in to pursue things that we want and pursue because of the prestige, because of the money. And probably sometimes we're thinking they might be our retirement accounts. We, 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 we're thinking we want them to grow up and, and take care of us. You know, so, so, so we're very careful because money, when they don't learn about money, it can derail their purpose. Why talk about money again? Because we drive people away from the faith. We will talk about money. There's some church you go, all the talk about is money. As you enter the door, it's money. It's money. It's money. It's money. It's money. I have a little bottle of oil. I'm going to sell you $20 for the oil. A piece of cloth is $20 for the cloth. All I talk about is money. Talk about tithing and talk about tithing in, in the wrong way where people feel condemned and people feel trapped where tithing is concerned. If you give this, you get that. And so people are fed up with, with, with the church partially because it's about money. It's become like a, a, a business, like a business driven by, by money. Who can make the most money? And so people are turned off by our many friends who said that one of the biggest reason why they don't want to go to church. Because all the preachers they talk about money. And then so many preachers are found in situations where we end up stealing money. So we have to get this issue of money right. All right, so. In dealing with you, we're going to want to go to the Bible to see oh Christ, what Christ says about money. And there's many parables, many scriptures I could go to. But I'm going to go to, to, go to um, this, this parable in Luke, six, Luke chapter, chapter 16. And it's called the parable of the shrewd manager. And I'm going to read it. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. All right? You cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will, will, will come into their homes. I don't know about you guys, but I turned 50 to, uh, in May. And it's like when I turn 50, is it more I'm thinking about tomorrow? Is it more I'm thinking about, I mean, what am I going to do? Will I have enough to, to, to help me retire? Me? Will I have enough to live when I really retire? What if I get sick? What if I. So, 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 so I have those, I have that concern. Like, like this manager, he, he had the ability to make the work, but he didn't. And I think we many times we are in a position where we can we, we can do better with our finance, but we don't do better with our finance. We're not good towards what we have. So just like the manager, he reached a point where he's saying, why, I don't know what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to lose my job. What am I going to do? So here's what he did. The scripture says, so he called in each one of his masters, debt debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe the master? The man said, 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quietly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So here's, here's the shrewd manager. He's now, he realized he's going to lose his job. He realized that, that, that he's not going to have anything. He's old. He can't strong to dig hole. And he's, a, he's ashamed to beg. So he's, he's, doing, he's do, using his brain now to make sure he, 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 he gets some money. He, he's in right standing. So when he loses his job, he'll be all right. He'll be taken care of. No, verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use world, worldly health well, sorry, to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal, eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with this very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with this little, very little, will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with your riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters, 
Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So, I want to make this clear from the onset that Christ was not saying in this parable that we should become jinals and con, con man and con woman and chip with chip with woman. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying to, to, to be tricksters, to, be, to lie our way out and to, be, to, 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 to do evil activities to get, to get what we need. I think what Christ was saying in this parable was that he was, he was presented, showed them two economies which are at work, two economies that use money, darkness and light. And, and, and so the world deals with money in a different way than, oh, we should be dealing with money. And so what he's saying is that the children of the world, the children of darkness, they understand that money is important. And what they will do, they will do according to their economy, according to their thinking, to do what it takes to be wealthy so that they are well set, their children are set, their children, children are set. Look at this. How many people out there you know who are wicked? They grow, they're rich, but they're wicked. They never change, never repent, never turn Christian, but they grow old and die rich and pass on their inheritance to their children. They're following the principles of the world and it works for them. Now here's what God is saying. God is saying to us, we, however, we live in this world and we use the same money that the evil people use, the same money. But what he's saying in this parable, I believe, is that we operate not under their principle. We don't operate on the evil that they use to get what they get. We operate under the principles that are kingdom-based. Is that making sense? So, so what we're saying, there are two principles, two principles at work. One that governs the world and one that governs those who are children of the light. We as Christians are children of the light. And there are kingdom principles that, go that governs the way we live and the way we respond. And that's what I want to talk about. But we need to know and develop the right attitude, the right principles that, that are needed in order, in, in order for us to be successful financially and deal money financially um, um, as we live in this time. And so the attitude we have must be kingdom-based. When we use the word attitude, an attitude is simpler way of thinking that is reflected in the way we behave. So attitude is a way we think and is reflected in the way that we behave. So as the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the heart flow the issues of life. So it's important that we have the right attitude towards money, the kingdom attitude towards money. It's important that we think about money the way God thinks about money. We have to have that thinking because it is based on those thinking that we will act, if that makes sense. So we have to get it. Now, what are some attitude, biblically, that we should have, have towards money? First thing, we must acknowledge that money is important and necessary for our survival. Ecclesiastes 10 says this. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry. I'm not saying go and drink and get drunk now, you know. But it says wife, make, that wife, wine, make, yes, wife makes life merry, yes. But, but wine makes life merry. And money is the answer for everything. It is not saying money the answer to give us joy, have joy, peace, and, and, and give us salvation. But in this life, what we need to do for the house, the clothing, whatever we need, it is money is needed. And if I don't think it's important, I'm going to deal with it as though it's unimportant and I'm going to become shipwrecked. And many of us, we are shipwrecked financially because the right thing, we don't, some of us don't think it's important or think it's important in the right way. And as such, we don't deal the right way. No. We may, it does not matter how much God came through for us. People may say, okay, God will provide for me. I don't even think about money. But God coming through for us, he worked through some other person who, who used their money to bless us, used their money to, to buy stuff for us when we are in need. And God, God has done that for us many, many times. We were in need and someone, and, and he sent someone. But those people who send it to us, they have to use money, spend money. And how many times are there in our lives when, we went without. 
because we just didn't have it. There are things that we needed and we just didn't have the money to do what we need to do. And we sat, we sit down and we go through, and yes, we may survive. Yes, God may come true for us. Yes, we have seen God's mercy, God's mercy upon our lives. But we have to acknowledge that money is important and it is necessary for survival in this time that we live. The next thing, next attitude is this. We cannot serve two masters. When it comes to money, we'll either worship our wealth or worship with our wealth. But we can't serve God and money. Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will become devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. God wants us to seek, seek him, his kingdom, and all his righteousness. And he says that everything else shall be added. Wealth is a byproduct of a life. Live seeking to be faithful to the things of God. So as we seek the things of God, as we love God with all our hearts and mind and soul and strength, the love for money is going to take its rightful place. That desire for money, that unholy quest for money is going to take its rightful place. And we really love God. Not that it's not going to be in the equation, not that we're going to see it as not being important, but because we love God so much, it's going to take um, 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 second place. For example, I, I'm here with Latoya, my wife, and I, I love her. I love her more than many most things in this in this life in this life, and and so if I, if I, if a basketball game is on, for example, and I love basketball and I want to watch a basketball game, and Latoya needs me for something something she's not feeling well, but I love basketball because I love her more. What I'm going to do? I'm going to attend to her need. It's going to trump the love I have for basketball. It doesn't mean I don't love basketball. It doesn't mean I don't want to watch basketball. But because I love Latoya so much, once a Garfield I'm not feeling well, I'm going to leave that television screen and jump up and leave her. I'll leave the television screen just to attend to her. So, so when we love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, money is going to fall in its rightful place. But we can't serve two masters. The thing we should have again about one is this, is that, listen, and this is important. This is something that I, I think is, is a root, root, root of money. The love of money, the love of money is root of all evil. So we have to always think about that. If we love money, just remember that love of money is root of all evil. First Timothy 6 and 10 says, for the love of money is a, is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Look at it. Think about when we love money, it's going to open up that door for envy. To force to become envious. Force to become jealous. Force to murder for, for, for infidelity. And force to become unfaithful to our callings. It opens that kind of door because many times to pursue money, there are things that we have to do that we, we don't need to do. We love something. We love something. You're going to do everything in your power to get that thing. So if we love money, we're going to do what we, what we, need, we think we need to do to get money. And guess what? We're going to pierce with many griefs. And we'll talk about it. Many, many families are broken. <laughs> Sometimes, not because the husband is cheating, but because the husband or the wife wants money so much. And they go out and they work and work and work and work and work and work. And the husband neglect the wife, and we have neglect the husband, and they have their needs, and they go and they cheat. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not supporting it, but because of that love for money, even when they have enough, that love for money push them to want more, want more. And so as a result, they keep going and keep going and keep going. Someone is neglected, and they go on, and an infidelity comes in play. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10 says this. Whoever loves money, listen to this, whoever loves money, never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And he's saying this too is meaningless. Whoever, so money is important, but, but if we love it too much, it's going to cause problem. Ecclesiastes 5 and 12. The sleep of a laborer is sweet. Whenever they eat, like, whenever, whether they eat, little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance deprive them of sleep. Think about it. A, a poor person go to their beds, they eat their food, they work hard, 
They sleep at night. The rich man is been lying down, thinking to himself, oh, oh why am I going to tomorrow to make some more money? Um, is Nikisha trying to rob me? He's never trying to spill for some money from me. He's not like trying to spill up my little money I have. So we're tripling everything to try to keep our money. So, so are we, are we go to our bed, our brains are turning, want to make some more money, want to make some more money. And, and it grabs us of sleep. It, it, it can rob us of, of the pleasures that life has to offer. No, on the other side, poverty can do that too. If you're too poor and you don't have any need, you don't have food to, food to eat, shelter, clothing, you don't have certain things, you also be at a place where you can't sleep. But in this instance, Solomon is saying that when you have a rich person, they can't sleep. There's, their abundance permits them no sleep. Next attitude towards money is that we need to see money as a means to an end, not the end. So money cannot buy, buy joy. Money cannot buy happiness. Money cannot fix marriages. Money cannot get us into heaven. And money is not the ultimate source of wealth. It's just a means to helping us live and live here on earth and enjoy life here on earth. But the Bible tells us that we should lay up treasures in heaven that can't be, can't, that can't rust, cannot rust. All right. So next, next attitude we need to about money is this. The reality is we're going to die. And guess what would die? Guess what happened? The money we have, we're going to leave it behind. So why kill ourselves? Why devalue valuable things around us when we're going to die and leave all this money we made behind? Left, we made, we'll leave it behind. Here's what Solomon says again in Ecclesiastes 5 and 13. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, her wealth lost to some misfortune. So that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. So guess what? We can't carry the money. We work for the money, but we can't carry it, if that makes sense. So it's important to write attitude towards money. Again, nothing is wrong with being wealthy. Nothing is wrong with being rich. It's just desire to be rich. What did that desire to be rich, that, that love of money that drives us away from God, the principles, that's the problem. Solomon was rich, yes. Abraham was rich, yes. Um, 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 Jacob was rich, yes. They were all rich. But the issue here is not that they pursue the wealth or they love the riches, they love God and they follow the principles. And these principles made them acted in a certain way. And as they acted in a certain way, the money comes. Remember it says, seek ye first. When we seek God and all his righteousness, everything else will be added because the kingdom principles that we follow, the wealth will come. The wealth may come, will come, and come at different levels for different people. So let's see now what that thinking would look like. Let's see what that thinking should look like. Because if we have a certain thinking, it should translate in how we practically, we, we handle money practically. All right, am I good so far? Follow me, am I good? All right, am I good? Never, I'm good, I'm good never. All right, all right, all right, okay. All right, all right, let's go. Let's, let's, let's rock and roll on. So, so, if, so if I'm saying we have this thinking, we always say that as a man think it's so easy. If I think this way, that's who I am. I'm a happy person because of the way I think. I'm an angry person because of what I think. So how I think determines who I act. So if we have these attitudes I lay out just a while ago, that money is important, um, that it's a means to an end, um, and that we need money, that, that we, we, we are, we're going to dial the money behind, behind us, we need to be acting according to what we think. And these are kingdom principles. These are things that God laid out for us in scriptures that I just read that we need to follow. And there are more. But just for time's sake, I pick these out. Now, let's look and see how this translates into living. The first thing, we must work. We must work. <laughs> we must work. Listen, as a church, we have all kinds of scripture we pull out and use. Like the wealth of wickedness laid up for the righteous. And we take it and we, we say we're not supposed to, we, 
it's, 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 it's not, in, in, indirectly we're not supposed to work. We just sit down and God going to drop money in our bank account and, and it's going to bless us. And what we do, we go to church and we drop $10 and a blessing of five minutes is going to come. Or we pay our tithe and, and from the tithe we're supposed to get rich. Or, or someone said, swell a little seed in my ministry, sell a little olive oil and you dab it with olive oil and you're supposed to get rich. They, those are gimmicks. We must work. This is kingdom principle. When God made Adam and put Adam in the Garden of Eden, he told Adam to, to work the garden, to work. That's the first thing God told man to do, to work, to work, to work. Adam and Eve, they were supposed to work in the garden. That means make, be productive where you are placed. Use your hands, use your mind, and work. And as you work, he says, he says work and keep the garden. Work means you're going to make it happen. Keep the garden, you're going to protect what you have. Be good stewards of what you have. So the first thing, we must work. Proverbs 24 and 30 says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. So, so this is about a vineyard. A vineyard grow grapes that can make money. But he was a sluggard. That means he was lazy. It didn't work. And so he said, thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. So he's seeing this person having the wherewithal to do what needs to be done. The Bible says that we have, we have been given everything that pertains to life and for godliness. So we have everything that we need to live in this life and be successful. So that's the vineyard. But we sit down and we're like sluggard. And as a result, thorns come up everywhere. The ground covered with weeds, sucking the very... It's very joy from us, sucking the prosperity that we can experience from us in this life. So here's what Solomon said. He saw that. And I'm certain many of us here, we have seen people who are like that, where they have potential, they can do better, they can make money, they can make wealth, but what they sit down and what they have, their God-given talents, their abilities, their opportunities. So what Solomon did, and this is what I want us to do today, I applied my heart so what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. And here's what he says. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like a harm man. So we sit down and we decide we're not going to work. And we sit down and we sit and we, we pray to God and we fast to God and we go to church and we jump and we shout. We, we come back home to an empty bank book, no food, like we struggle because a little sleep, a little slumber, a little fall of the hands. And poverty will come upon us like a thief and scarce like an armed man. Proverbs 6 and 6. He said, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider ways and be wise. The ants work nonstop. And store food up in winter. They store food. They're always working and storing food. So if we have that kingdom mindset, we're going to work. We're going to work. Next thing is this. We must enjoy the food, food, fruits of our labor. Listen. As we live and as we work, we're going to enjoy the fruits of our labors, labor. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 18. I have seen personally what is the only beneficial and appropriate course of action for people. To eat and drink and find enjoyment in all their hard work on earth during the few days of their life that God has given them for this is their reward. To every man whom God has given wealth. So you see, he's not saying wealth is wrong. He's saying to every man whom God has given wealth, God will give us wealth and possession. Again, I would say before, we follow certain principles. So he's saying to everyone who has been given wealth and possessions, he has also given him the ability to eat from them. To eat from them, to travel, buy nice pair of sneakers and nice shoes. Just, just, just do so, enjoy. Go out and buy a big steak once for a month if you can do it. If you can't buy a steak, go and buy whatever it is that you can buy. I mean, two, two patties or something. Just, just, just do, do something that, 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 that you want to, that makes you feel good, that, that's enjoyable. But buy a DVD, go to the movie, do something and find enjoyment in this toil because these are the gift of God. So as we work, we want to enjoy the fruit of our labor. And again, 
God wants to enjoy what he gives us. But here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to leave an inheritance for children, children. That's what a righteous man does. He leaves an inheritance for his children, children. It does not have to be a big bank account. It does not have to be a million dollars. It does not have to be a house. But and, and let, let me clarify this by a matter of fact. It, 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 leaving their return doesn't necessarily mean physical thing. It could mean just a, a legacy, like that, that, that the way you teach them. I think those are even more important. We teach you. What are you teaching children? Are you leaving something that they can hold on to that can take them far more than the money can? Because while it's good, we'll leave money or something materially for them. Sometimes we're not always in that position. I want to make that clear because I don't want anyone to walk with feeling condemned. But I, I have to address it. But I think the great inheritance that we can leave for children is just loving people, loving God, being men and women of integrity, or, or to live so that when we're gone, they can live based on what we taught them. But it's also important that if we can leave them a little money, leave them a little property, that's good. Listen, when it comes to the black race, for example, I can talk about the blacks, even Jamaica where the Indians are concerned. The Indians have built their wealth. And they pass it down to their children, children. So they always have money. They're always a step ahead of, of the regular black man in Jamaica. Because we struggle so much. And sometimes we don't, we don't try to leave, leave something for our children, children. So what, what happens is that they generational poverty. So, so there's nothing for them. To, so they, we're always starting from scratch. They're always ahead of us because their parents leave something for them. So, so if we can as much as possible, let us do this. Borrow less because of a good steward. Borrow less money. Proverbs 27 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. If we keep on borrowing and borrowing money, we'll never have. And the people who we borrow from, they're going to own us, and we're not going to be at peace. Let's borrow less. There are times that we have to borrow money, there are times when we're just not buying, and it's important. But what are we borrowing money for? Borrowing money just, just to travel, go to a trip, trip to, to Paris just because when well, you go to Paris, is you have a, is it, your child coming to you and, and want an expensive sneakers because everyone else is wearing sneakers and, and, and you don't have the money, but you want child to feel good and so you buy the sneakers. Why, why are we borrowing the money? And, and that's, that's, that's not for me to tell you what to do, but I'm just saying, the scripture is saying that when we borrow money, and we know it, all of us here who have borrowed money from someone, know what it feels like when we borrow money, and we say the person, I don't have it, and we know it's due, and we can't give it. Sometimes we want to hide in the supermarket, and we just feel uncomfortable, we say the person, that's the reality. So we save and spend this. Next thing is this, think before you spend. So we have the money, think before you spend. Think before you build and have these grand plans. Look at Luke 14, 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. It's important that we think about what we're doing. Count the cost. Can you afford this thing before you start it? Don't do this thing because everybody is doing it. I want to fit in. Count the cost. Think before we spend. Kingdom principle. Next one is this. Guard our hearts. So if, 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 if we're having those kind of thinking about money, we know it's important, but we know it can derail us. We know that if we love it, it's gonna, it can pierce us with many griefs and, and we can do things we shouldn't be doing. We have to be guarding our hearts. So money do not affect us negatively. Proverbs 4 and 23 says this. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. So guard our heart. Our heart here is, is not your heart that's beating your chest. Your heart is really your mind, the way you think. We have to talk about your heart is your mind, what you think. Guard your thinking. Guard what comes into your mind. Because out of it flow the issues of life. Everything flows from it. In other words, what we do flows from what we think. I, if I'm going to take up a cup, I have to think about it. If I'm going to slap someone, I have to think about it. If I'm going to start my car, I have to think about it. Whatever we do comes from where we think, consciously or subconsciously. So check the thoughts that come into our minds concerning money. Are these thoughts honoring God's word? Are they lined up with God's, what God's word says? So, so if I start to become envious because 
because Glenn Roy, I have one that I am. Something's wrong. Check that thought. And if we realize these thoughts, thoughts that we're having towards money contradict what God says, says in his word, we need to tear them down. Second Corinthians 10 says, we demolish every argument and every pretension that set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So we have to take those thoughts that, that, that cause us to think about money in the wrong way into captivity so we don't run with it. Well, that's making sense. Now, what we look practically again to is this, is that we need to be rich towards God. We need to be rich towards God. And, and, and this particular um, verse is in Luke 12, and um, where this man, the crowd, was, was shown to Christ, um, telling Christ to tell his brother to divide the land, <laughs> the land between him and his brother. So it's a long time people fight them fighting for land, you know. So back then, man was saying, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. In other words, tell my brother to give me part of the land. People are always fighting for money. And Christ said, listen, I'm not going to deal with that. Christ warned him, look out, be your guard because, for all kinds of greed. Because in medically, life does not consist in an abundance of possession. And then he told the parable of the man who, who plant and, start, and crops grow. As the crops grow, he, he start thinking now, okay, so I have this crop, I have this, and it'll be a small barn. When this barn is filled, I'm going to build another barn. When this barn is built, I'm going to build another barn. And here's what Christ God, God says to him. You fool, this night your very life will be demanded from, from you. Then who will get what you pray for yourself? So here he was. And we did that many times. We have a lot of here. And we're thinking, how are we going to get rich? How are we going to get rich? What are we going to do? And we're not thinking about today. Not that we should have planned. We're also consumed about getting possession to the point that we forget about God and we forget about life and others in the process. But this is what Christ says in verse 21. This is how it will be with whomever stores up things for themselves, but it's not rich towards God. So as we think about money, we have to reach towards God. But what does it mean to reach towards God? To be rich towards God is to be guided by the Spirit and walk in obedience to what the Word of God says. So we're doing things unto God. Give to those who are in need. Visit the sick, the widow. Deal fearly with those who are around you. Wives, submit to husband, husband to wife. Children will be your parents. Parent, take care of your pick of them. So, so to reach towards God is being guided and walk in obedience to, to what it tells us to do. And we do those things, we're going to see the reward. Following this very same parable, he gave the instruction that we're not supposed to worry about anything. And what he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything shall be added. It's important that we seek the kingdom of God. That's his principles. The principles that governs heaven. And do what it says. So we have to read the Bible and understand what the principle about, says about, about, about money, kingdom principles about money. What, what does it say? And then the kingdom of which God is will bring, will back us up every time. So if, so if we find the principle that governs the kingdom of heaven, God does govern being a Christian, we find them and do what they say, God will back us up every time. When we seek God with all our hearts, the love and desire for money will fade. And if God chooses to make us rich, if he do choose to make us rich, let us not be arrogant. Let us not put our hope in the wealth, but in God. He is the one who gives the ability to make wealth, and he can take it away in a heartbeat. Again, give, be willing to share. In this way, we will lay up treasures for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that when, so that we may take all of life that is truly life. First Timothy six and seventeen verse nineteen says, "Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for enjoyment." Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Wealth is not evil. To be rich is not evil. But the pursuing of money to be rich, the pursuing of money, the love of money, that is what is evil. 
But if we follow these godly principles and allow the Spirit of God to lead us, we can live a balanced life and open and doors will be open for God to bless us in whatever way he chooses, the magnitude he chooses to bless us. But we have to do it based on kingdom principle.